Hello and welcome to The Nexus. Today's show, Xi means business. China's President Xi Jinping is being flattered and wooed by pretty much every leader on the planet. It's time to find out more about him then. Here's what we're focusing on. Who is Xi? We're going to be looking into his personal life, his business dealings, and how he makes his rivals disappear. The gift horse from France's president, a DVD box set from Britain's prime minister, why are Western leaders so desperate to please him? And might is right. China's military is growing fast every year. How long until it can match the United States? We're going to be finding out here in the Nexus. Hello, I'm Matthew Moore, and today in the Nexus, we're trying to work out if China's president is now the world's most powerful leader and if he should be embraced or feared. So, we have a Chinese military expert and former White House advisor, Dennis Wilder. We also have Yan Bennett. Now, she used to be America's vice consul to China. And finally, we have Professor Kerry Brown, the author of CEO China, who has actually met President Xi. We'll try to squeeze out an anecdote from him a little later. Oh, so now we're all gathered. Let's watch our first report. We've all heard of the American dream, but what is the Chinese dream? President Xi has four pillars for his vision to make China great again. The Chinese dream is about the prosperity of the country, the rejuvenation of the nation, and the happiness of the people. This phrase, probably more than any other to date, has come to define Xi's leadership, particularly at home, and has become ubiquitous in China. This very hopeful and optimistic vision has been accompanied by the toughest crackdown on dissension since the Tiananmen crisis of 1989. He's overseen a far-reaching anti-corruption campaign, bagging extremely well-connected political, military, and business figures, as well as potential political rivals, and put himself in charge of numerous leading small groups which direct policy on sensitive issues such as internal security, economic reform, and foreign affairs. Xi Jinping has emerged as a very powerful leader. Uh, previous party elders would not be in a position to interfere in his policy programs. He has overseen China's massive land reclamation activities in the South China Sea, expanding China's military footprint thousands of kilometers offshore. Xi has achieved a quasi-cult-like standing within China, reminiscent of the 1960s, when the great helmsman Mao Zedong lorded over the Chinese masses. Uh, uh, there probably has not been, uh, in certainly recent decades, a leader uh, with quite the same character, uh, quite the same personality, uh, quite the same ambition as we see in the current leader of China, Xi Jinping. Well, let's go to Kerry Brown first. You used to be a British diplomat in China, and you spent many years there, and you've actually met President Xi. Can you just tell us what that was like? What, what is he like? Well, I, I mean, it's a grand statement to say I met him. I was part of a delegation in 2007 when he was briefly party secretary of Shanghai. I think he was there for about seven months. So it was completely fortuitous. I mean, it wasn't really planned. And uh, I think the story was that when he was in Shanghai, uh, the main function was just to sort of keep a very, very low profile and meet unimportant people like us <laughs> uh, rather than important people because then he'd get into trouble. And within um, I think October, he was then actually taken to the central leadership. So that ended his 
quite long provincial career, 20 years, I think. Kerry, let, let's just delve a little bit into his personal life, which I know you would have looked into quite closely for your book. Uh, we've got a picture coming up here of, uh, of Xi and his father there, just to the left of him, a very young Xi. Um, just tell us what happened uh, to his father and how that affected his chances of getting into the Communist Party and then uh, eventually the ascent. So his father, Xi Zhongshun, was a vice premier involved with propaganda work in the 50s. And then he was felled in 60, 61, 62 and put under house arrest. Uh, so for 19 years, he wasn't really available. I think Xi may have met him maybe once or twice in that period. So you'd say that Xi Jinping's childhood was pretty tough after 1961. Then when the Cultural Revolution started in 66, it got even tougher. And what's amazing is that Xi was uh, sent off to the countryside for re-education and wasn't even able to you know, become a member of the Communist Party. Uh, it took him several attempts. And then, from there, he's risen right to the top. It's extraordinary. Yeah, I think he tried to join in 73, and he made 10 attempts, and the 10th one he got. But, I mean, those experiences are very typical for the people who were the elite before 1966. They did, almost all of the people around Xi Jinping would have had those kind of stories. Uh, so he is, uh, you know, he's got a particular memory of the Maoist period, which is why it's a bit strange saying that he's the new Mao of China. I think he has very ambiguous feelings about Mao Zedong, but he certainly respects Mao as the founding father of the country. Let's pop over to Jan Bennett. Jan, um, when you think about the crackdown that uh, Xi is now famous for, um, just tell us about that. Is that a genuine crackdown on corruption or just a way of getting rid of political rivals? Um, I think it's both. Uh... The, the people of China, they do have certain wishes. Uh, one of them is to um, um, address the, the corruption that, that's going on in the Chinese government. Um, this is also a political tool for uh, Xi Jinping to, um, to address his political rivals in a way that is uh, under the guise of legality. Um, these, are, these, these are cases that are brought to court um, so that... Uh, you know, it, it, it is fully prosecuted within the court system. It's, it's shown that it's a legal uh, decision. So he is, he is genuinely cracking down on corruption, but presumably he's picking and choosing uh, the certain types of people he wants to go after and in a way using that to exclude his rivals? That's correct. Uh, so, so perhaps um, those who are on side then, they may also be corrupt but are left alone. In certain cases, yes. I mean, we don't have full view um, of, of what's going on within the Chinese government, but, um, you know, based on what we've seen, uh, what you're saying is correct. The 19th Congress, which happens every five years, we saw lined up on the stage seven men, the, the Politburo Standing Committee, and they are all literally standing. Now, they're all in their 60s, and none of them appear to be a successor to Xi, was that all, that's all deliberate. He plans to stay on a long time? Yes, I think the point is that Xi Jinping, and some have talked about this, thinks that he will be around and in a leadership role till 2035. He has set ambitious goals for that period of time. Um, whether or not he remains in the party secretary job, I don't think really matters very much, to be honest with you. Like Deng Xiaoping, he probably will step to the back of the stage, but that doesn't mean he's going to give up power. Whether he gives up power after the next five years uh, in terms of the party secretary role is not clear yet. But he certainly did not put anybody in place on that Politburo Standing Committee or give any indication of a successor at this point. Okay, let's go back to Kerry. Um, uh, Kerry, would you say that he has the potential to become a dictator, or is the party itself the all-powerful machine here? I mean, I think there is a dictator of China, and it is the party. It's not him as an individual. And that's the difference between him and someone like Putin or, or any other political leader. I mean, he has uh, the insight, I suppose, originally to have made the Communist Party highly disciplined through bashing up the elite in this anti-corruption struggle and instilling this kind of moral message or this moral mandate that China's moment of national resurrection and greatness is imminent and people have to remain disciplined. What ha happens, happens after that's achieved, I don't know. But I think his individual powers are probably overstated. I think the party is the powerful thing and he is you know, totally representative of it. He's a creature of it. He grew uh, through its institutions and his power is completely integrated with the power of the party. So he is a very, very effective and powerful servant. Okay, Kerry, thank you. Now, we started uh, looking 
at Xi's family, the father. Uh, now let's look at uh, Xi's wife, a very famous uh, folk singer. Let's have a listen to her a little bit. Well, she has, a, she has a lovely voice, uh, Kerry. Now, they've been married for something like 30 years, and mm. they're sort of trying to portray themselves as China's first couple. We're used to seeing that in the United States, but is that a bit unusual for China? Yeah, I mean, Hu Jintao's wife was very, very, his predecessor was very low-key, and uh, Jiang Zemin's wife was very low-key, Deng's, like, Deng's wife was very low-key, so this is unusual. I mean, the only precedent is not a very good one, and that's Jiang Qing, the wife of Mao Zedong, and she was one of the Gang of Four the sort of radical leaders. Peng Liuan is a highly connected, I mean, I think she's a lieutenant colonel in the, in the army, the PLA. Wow. So she's a highly internet connected yeah. person. She was more famous so than he before actually, became power. So he actually married up initially then? Mm. Yes. <laughs> OK, fine. Uh, well, uh, much of Xi's power on the world stage is thanks to China's strong economy, of course, and world leaders are queuing up to visit him, bearing gifts. These are happy days for China's president taking tea with the UK's Prime Minister who brought him a lovely DVD box set of Blue Planet. Hope he has a DVD player. It came with a personalised message from its presenter David Attenborough. But still, not quite as impressive as the gift horse from France's president Emmanuel Macron. Vesuvius, an eight-year-old brown gelding from the elite Republican Guard. And the greatest gift of all from President Donald Trump the U-turn. Far from confronting China, which he had accused of raping his country, he heaped praise on President Xi. We have developed a friendship, I can see that, and I think long term we're going to have a very, very great relationship and I look very much forward to it. May's three-day trip to China secured deals worth $12.5 billion. Macron's three-day trip reportedly yielded 50 business deals. But the Donald enjoyed the biggest jackpot in his two-day visit, announcing $250 billion worth of deals. Huge. A wild exaggeration, according to some. None of them publicly made a big deal about human rights in China. It seems money talks. And China has a lot of money the world's biggest stockpile of foreign reserves. It's also the world's biggest exporter, and China's economy is expected to grow 6.5% this year. Not great for China, maybe, but way ahead of the expectations for America's economy, just 2.7%. It's amazing to think that when Reagan became president in 1981, China's economy was just a tenth of America's. Now experts are predicting it will overtake the US by 2032. America first. America first or America second? Well, an incredible prospect, but it looks like it will happen. If I could just come to the panel, first of all, uh, sorry to ask, but if you could raise your hand if you think that China's economy will certainly overtake, overtake the United States. In size, yes. That's pretty much everybody, That's I think. Um, and will it be by 2032, Kerry? I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, as, um, so just, so just, as I said, in size, sure, per capita, it'll take forever. I think per yes. capita is the main thing. Uh, that's the big difference, isn't it? When, when you divide the economy by the number of people, uh, Dennis, you still have a, a long way back. I mean, the, the, the Chinese are a fraction of what the Americans earn per person. It's a huge country with uh, many poor people still. Uh, you have to remember that the middle class and the upper class in China it represents uh, a fraction of the population. It is not the majority of the population at this point. Uh, Jan, if I could come to you, what does having a strong economy do for Xi on the world stage? How does it strengthen his hand? Um, he has much more bargaining power um, if China becomes a large market, um, much larger than it is currently, then uh, of course um, China would have uh, greater, would wield greater um, economic and political power. Um, I want to agree with Dennis. Uh, right now in China, there are millions of people who are still living under $2 a day. Um, so she has a huge job to lift these people out of poverty. Um, to grow the economy uh, by 2032, I think, is, is frankly very ambitious um, to be the... Uh, yeah. Kerry, you know, there was, a, there was a time when, when Western leaders, I was just looking over some old articles from when John Major was Britain's Prime Minister, would go over to China and tell them, yes, we want to do business with you, but you are really falling short on human rights. This isn't happening anymore, at least not publicly. 
No, I mean, I think it's part of this huge values difference. So for sure, when you see Xi Jinping speak, he's got a kind of full vocabulary of this kind of confident tone. Mm. And China's, you know, kind of proved that it can make a one party state so far sustainable. But I think there's very big questions about in the long term whether it is really sustainable. At the moment, uh, he's been a lucky leader since 2012. He's been a really lucky leader and he's reaping the benefit of that. Yan, you know a lot about what's going on in terms of human rights uh, in China. Would you say that uh, under Xi Jinping, they've actually, it's, the situation has actually become much worse? Um, I believe so. There has been a crackdown on uh, free speech in China. It's to maintain state control. Um, uh, during uh, Trump's recent visit, he was supposed to talk about uh, Liu, Xia, um, uh, Liu Xiaobo's wife who's under house arrest currently, um, and uh, he chose not to speak about um, that case. Um, I think it's a, it, it speaks more to U.S. leadership, um, frankly. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, uh, actually, just to talk about U.S. leadership, do you think that the United States under Trump is, is pulling out of its uh, leadership and, and globalization role and that she is now stepping in and promising the world that, that he will defend global trade? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, I believe the United States is stepping away from um, the, a global leadership position. Um, and I, ambiguously, I agree with you that uh, um, Xi Jinping is, is trying to be the world leader for free trade. Uh, whether or not it takes on the role as what the United States does currently, I, I, um, I, I, I would find some disagreement. Uh, while we're staying on the economy, I just want to quickly get into this Belt and Road uh, phrase, which we've heard a great deal about, and uh, I sort of quickly define it over this little graphic here. You know, it's, it's a strategy aimed at giving China a much larger role in global affairs using a China-centered trading network. Now, the routes will run along six corridors from China across Euro Eurasia into Europe itself, as well as a maritime route that will run from the Chinese coast through Singapore to the Mediterranean. Beijing wants to basically underwrite billions of dollars of investment fo uh, focusing on infrastructure such as ports, high-speed trains, roads, power grids. Kerry, if I can just come to you, why is China doing this? And is this going to be a white elephant or is this really going to ratchet up its power across the world? Well, it's early days. I mean, it's very abstract, so I think 64 countries are informally involved in it. And uh, the idea really is to use China's strength, so to create an area of economic commonality. But there's a sort of undercurrent of security issues, and that's probably where the main problems are going to be. India doesn't really like the idea. I think other countries are sceptical, and we mm. don't really have many solid examples at the moment. You know, um, China may be ruled by a communist party, but China's top politicians are some of the richest in the world. Extraordinary. Take a look at this. We've got 100 members of parliament in the advisory body, all dollar billionaires, and their fortunes have grown 64% since she came to power in 2008. If you took the combined wealth of 209 delegates, which is over $500 billion, that's bigger than the whole of Belgium's annual GDP. And you might actually recognize some of the wealthier ones. We're looking at here Pony Ma, the CEO of the tech giant Tencent, Robin Lee, the founder of the search engine Baidu, he sits on the MPC, alongside the Hong Kong billionaire Victor Lee. Uh, it's an interesting question, um, <laughs> Dennis. Why do they even call themselves a communist party? Well, uh, there is, that is a question. I think that capitalism has taken root in China and that the leadership wants to uh, reap the benefits for themselves. And so, uh, yes, this is a contradiction in the Chinese system. And uh, the Chinese leadership knows this. This is why the anti-corruption campaign has been so important to the Chinese leadership, because they want to make sure that the public doesn't think that all of these people got there by illicit means. I think it's still true that there are no dollar billionaires in the United States Congress, and uh, that's supposed to be the, the absolute prime example of capitalism going, going absolutely rampant there. Well, I, I, I do think that the Chinese Communist Party has a problem uh, when the people in China see this excessive wealth of some of these uh, leaders and their families. Is it because uh, they, as politicians, are very closely linked to the most powerful businesses in the country? One of the things that you've seen in this period of time since Deng Xiaoping said to get rich is glorious is that party members use their authority, use their ability, for example, to lease land, to uh, allow use of ports, 
uh, the party is very powerful in China, and it has a lot of ability to uh, allocate resources. Ah, okay. And so it's not surprising that party members have been able to use this and exploit yes. this. Yes, okay. Well, the strong economy, of course, gives China's president a lot of clout on the world stage, but it doesn't end there. On the military front, too, China's rising. China. Imagine an arcade game called World Superpowers, with each character having their strengths and weaknesses. Round one, fight! Well, President Xi controls the third most powerful military in the world, behind the United States and Russia. While China's second or third in many areas, in manpower, it's number one. 2.26 million active personnel dwarfing America with just 1.3. But China's still playing catch up to the United States in most other areas. Round two, fight! For example, America has far more fighter jets than China and 19 all powerful aircraft carriers to China's one. Then there's the ultimate game changer, nukes. The US has 6,800 warheads to China's 270. Both countries, of course, have their spheres of influence. The US has soldiers stationed all over the world, particularly in Europe, South Korea and Japan. By comparison, China finally set up its first overseas base in 2017 in Djibouti. The number of soldiers stationed there, unknown. But where could there be tension and overlap of influence? Well, the South China Sea seems a good bet. China claims almost all of it, building artificial islands to make sure everyone knows who's boss. The US and its allies don't recognize these claims. Well, that may work while America has the supreme military, but China's catching up fast by increasing its military spending every year for the last two decades. In 2000, it spent just $14 billion. 10 years later, $123 billion. And now that figure has doubled to $250 billion. While that's still less than half of what the United States spends, $600 billion, China's military is clearly closing in fast. So let me come to you then, Dennis, so since it's your speciality. Why keep ratcheting up spending if you don't want to be the biggest and the best? Well, what they want is primacy in East Asia. So the Chinese aren't trying to be a global power like the United States, where the United States projects power all over the world. What China wants to do is control the East China Sea, South China Sea. They want to control out to what they call the second or third island chain. Uh, what they want to do basically is back up the American forward presence in East Asia, move us away from their coastal areas, move us out. And as Xi Jinping says, the Pacific is big enough for both of us. Really? The American <laughs> concern is that the Chinese want to divide up the Pacific and keep us out of certain places. Just really briefly, do you think ultimately there could be conflict there? We had that uh, US aircraft carrier going past the artificial islands and there was a bit of a skirmish, well, not skirmish, but there was a bit of a, a words, and words were had there. I was at the White House when a Chinese aircraft uh, took down an American aircraft over the South China Sea, what was called the EP3 crisis of 2001, um, it is very easy to see that we could have another of those kinds of incidents. Uh, it, my worry is more about miscalculation. Uh -huh. More and more uh, American and Chinese uh, ships and aircraft are coming close to each other. Uh, you could have something spark off just simply because a pilot makes a mistake. Fair enough. OK, uh, let's get a quick uh, old quotation from Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong. I mean, he said, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. You're all familiar with that, uh, but perhaps I'm using it out of context. Kerry, do you think it's in the Communist Party DNA, that, that expression? And do you think that has any relevance to today's military build-up? No, I mean, I think the Communist Party is trying to conquer people's hearts, and that's a totally different um, thing. So its history of violence is probably not a super great thing. At the moment, I think in internal repression, it uses preemptive repression, so very skillful use of the internet and kind of just getting problems before they happen. And I think it's trying to get its message out with things like the Belt and Road and the idea that, you know, there's a China dream for all of us. I think the end problem is that it is an exclusive power. Its values are very exclusive. They exclude us. So even if it wanted a global role and we wanted it to have a global role, it wouldn't be easy for us to find a place with it and it wouldn't be able to take us on easily. So yeah. I think it's a very difficult outcome. O others might point to the other, the other big leader, Deng Xiaoping's maxim. He said uh, once, hide your strength, bide your time. Uh, Jan Bennett, uh, should we be concerned that that is still what's happening and one day China will emerge as the preeminent military power or not? Um, I don't think so. Uh, China does not want to project power beyond um, the East Asia region. 
Um, I agree with Dennis on that, um, that, you know, it, it doesn't want to be uh, what it doesn't want to take on the role that the United States does currently, where it projects power into several theaters. It only wants to be where it is right now. OK, a final question from all of you, just a yes or no answer. We'll start with you, Dennis. Do you think if they made a, a Chinese Mount Rushmore that it would be, you know, uh, Mao Zedong, uh, Deng Xiaoping and then and then Xi Jinping? Would he feature? I think that Xi Jinping would love to see that happen. <laughs> and I think he's working to get to a point where his legacy is as great as Deng and Mao. Ian, do you think he's going to be up there one day? Um, if there was a Chinese Mount Rushmore, I think those three would be up there. I would also add Jiang Zemin. Uh, Kerry? So Chinese Mount Rushmore, there'd be Mao, 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 and Mao. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Kerry Brown, thank you very much for your contribution to the Nexus today. Jan Bennett also, and uh, Dennis Wilder, thank you. Thank you all very much. Well, that's all for this week. Next week, we're taking a look at the shadows forming over the Rainbow Nation and the man many blame for South Africa's troubles. Is the laughing president now beyond a joke? See you then. Thanks for watching. <laughs>